Deep Dive Film School makes no claim of ownership of the film footage used in this episode. The film footage is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Also, we're going to spoil the hell out of this movie, so this is your warning. Welcome to Deep Dive Film School! Oh, this week we're getting to that one scene from Glen Gary, Glen Ross. Fuck you! That's my name! Alright everybody, I am Adam Sherlock. And I'm Adam Pulcher. And if you like what you see slash hear, please like and subscribe. You can find us in all the spaces and places the people what? Find good media. That's right. That's right. We got all sorts of things. We got these that one scenes where we, where we analyze scenes uh, on a regular basis. We have our festivals that are constantly going. Sometimes we'll throw in a forgotten gem. We need to do a reca recasting. I keep saying this. I know. Uh, we we got to find a space for a recasting somewhere agree. soon. I completely agree. So we got a bunch of stuff. We look at uh, film history. We look at uh, you know what was the the importance of silliness. That yes. Was one thing yeah. That we yeah. Analyzed. We do some one hundred and one. So just yeah. a, a ton of a ton of film analysis about film history and some of our favorite stuff to watch and stuff that we discover too on our own. So please, yeah. Um, I'll stop pitching this uh, subscribe thing, but just want to give you a reason uh, to hang out with us. So yep. really appreciate everyone listening, watching, subscribing, doing all that. That one scene from Glary, uh, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. It's, yes. It's actually it's like. Uh, Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene, Glenn, Gary, Glenn, Ross kind yeah. of thing here. And I know that one of the Glenn says two G's and one doesn't. And yeah. I'm like, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know, know what, anymore. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it, this is the always be closing ABC, scene. Yep. Always be closing. Yep. The, the opening scene to this 1992 J James Foley movie is the director. And, and I never think about... I always just assume Mamet directed this because he wrote it, he did the play, yeah, I mean, he it's... adapted it to the screen for this. You and know, when you talk his about mark is so heavy on this movie, so right? Just... When you when you talk about Mamet style dialogue, this is oh the God. movie, yeah, right? Like it. this is the one that people think about, for and sure. it is, um, yeah, it exists in this weird. But he, of course, I, I think we got to mention, you know, House of Games, Wag the Dog, like the stuff that he's done, Spanish Prisoner. Yes, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that one. Uh, Steve Martin's in it. I love Spanish. Uh, I do Prisoner. too. I own it. It's a great movie. It's yeah. a great movie as well. Uh, but like Forgotten uh, Gem. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah, is yeah, a Forgotten yeah. Gem for sure. But I bet there's some mammoth heads out there that are super. Uh, you know, this is a classic movie, and, and it always has been in my eyes. And I haven't watched it in a long time, so I was so excited to revisit this particular scene. It's hard to turn off after this scene ends. Huh? Kind of, yeah. It's just like I—I I mean, this—this this is the setting up everything mm -hmm. for the movie. But go ahead. I was just gonna say this exists in this weird, um, really dilapidated world of sales. Mm. I—I mm. I can't. You can't help but think of like Death of a Salesman, like the, the sure. you know, that that kind of character. This like schlubby rumpled suited guy who just like can't quite catch a break I mean, and the, the the big leads the big money's always well, out you, there you can't like, see jack lemon's character yeah. with especially after they renditioned it in the simpsons, the simpsons for so long and had this oh gil death. just needs gil, a, oh god gil uh, needs one just, good just, one good shot give at me a sale it, come on fuck. man just sign on the line it's so <laughs> sad but right like, you can't not look at him and think of death of a salesman completely for sure yeah 100 yeah. percent. but then it's also it, for some reason i wrote this down it feels like it exists also in kind of like a, a, obviously a much more toned down world um than this but i think of something like brazil where you have like these characters that just have this job that like even though the movie explains what their job is you're also like i don't get exactly like sure. what are you selling like what's and they purposely make it feel like this vague ethereal thing that when they when they try to talk about it with potential clients they're pumping it all up to be this big thing. Obviously, we see that with with Pacino sure. uh, doing that in, in a I scene, mean, actually, with... Uh, I forget the actor's name, but the guy from Brazil. Uh, uh, his, Jonathan, his, Price? Jonathan Price? Jonathan yeah. Price, thank you. But it's like, then when they're on their own and they're talking about these, like, these, these are shit leads. These are terrible properties. Sure, sure. They're like, none of it I really... Mean, th this movie, I, I think a lot, especially in early 90s when this was made, when Mamet wrote it, you know, he was he was a manager of this office and hated it and just basically kind of wrote about it. Um, mm. Obviously to a dramatic degree, but this is really about the toxicity of kind of business culture, right? Completely. And that macho perception of I've got to lie, cheat, and steal to get anything I want because this is a cutthroat world and 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, which we you, see, you know, again. it's capitalism at its best, right? <laughs> right, and which we see again in things like Wolf of Wall Street, early scenes of okay, Wolf of Wall so Street. Th- and... That's actually a point I wanted to make later on, but since you're talking about it now, it's really interesting that this scene in particular and what this movie's about is that stuff and how toxic and abusive it, it is. But the movies that take away from this movie the most are the are the boiler room and uh, Wolf of Wall Street type of like the the same thing that this is about like having the same kind of mindset but like yeah. glorifying it yeah. when I bet that was not Mamet's uh, true intention when he wrote this. This was actually At the all. opposite. So it's funny to see the pop culture that lat- latches onto it because it is a bunch of macho, tough guy uh, dialogue and talking shit and calling people names and being abusive and, and, and all of this stuff. So it's just kind of funny to think, like I would love to know what you think about that because the intention of what he meant to say kind of gets twisted uh, later on in the life of, of this movie. I mean, I think that that's really interesting, and I think the, your, the case in point for that is that the if you think about the movie Wall Street, uh, Gordon Gekko's greed is good yeah. speech is quoted verbatim in Boiler Room, right? And you also see something like American Psycho really loving this, uh, the characters in that anyway, really loving and idolizing those kinds of cutthroat characters. Yeah. And here... With the exception of Alec Baldwin's nameless character, right? Which, oh, it's fuck you. It's fuck you is his name. I know. Well, and I love this because because the the beginning, this quote, put that coffee down. Who am I? I'm from downtown. I'm from Mitch and Murray. Again, more faceless kind of like we never mm-hmm. see any of those characters. And it's not put that coffee down. It's coffees for closers. Coffees for closers. Yeah. <laughs> but this idea of like like that he is the only real macho one there. And all of our main characters that we stay with, I mean, even the most macho, if we want to call it, of those characters is Pacino's character, who isn't even in this scene. Yeah, Um, it's really interesting he's not in this scene. And he's this big liar who's out there, actually, he's the top top seller of this office. As we see from the chalkboard, the kind of ranking people's, the amount of money they made this year, and, and Romo, which is Pacino's character. I wonder how this scene would have gone if he was in it. Because I feel like his character wouldn't have put up with that. He shit. wouldn't have. And Ed Harris is on the edge mm-hmm. of not putting up with it. Yeah. And, and the next scene, he basically is, fuck these guys. Yeah, you know, totally. Like, hey, you know, like the whole thing. Like, And then where you see Alan Arkin and Jack Lemon, you know, Jack Lemon's probably the more desperate one. Mm-hmm. Alec Ar- Alan Arkin, who's a treasure, a national treasure, I oh, fucking love that guy, yes. doesn't say two words in this movie nope. and doesn't say one word after Alec ba- Baldwin starts talking. And, um, you know, it, it, it's pretty, it's, it's just kind of interesting to see that evolution. Well, you mentioned this sort of macho machismo thing that's happening here, and I think that it's worth also noting there's a real ageist thing also where... Alec Baldwin comes in as the guy with the BMW and all this, and he says, I've been in this game for 15 years. And you're like, to all three of these other guys, that's piddles. That's nothing, Mm -hmm. right? But they're still in their schlubby, wrinkled suits, Mm -hmm. sitting in this office corral. And this guy who's, I mean, what, probably still a decade older than Ed Harris's character mm-hmm. comes in and just rakes all of them over the coals, calling them pussies, calling them every name in the book. Yeah, and you just go, there is this this toxic masculinity thing that's happening here too. Definitely. that's so on the nose, right? Oh, hundred percent. It's also just class warfare and elitism, like ageism, dri- like all it's of it. dripping yeah. in the scene. Mm-hmm. The I'm better than you. You're weak because you suck. Yeah. <laughs> and these people are suckers. They're they're out there. They're begging. They're begging, begging to be taken advantage of. Yeah. And do you have the balls to do it? The yeah. brass balls to do it? Oh, man. Which also, I'm pretty sure, I just, you know, not to put too fine a point, find a point on it, but I think that the only thing that Alec Baldwin's character carries around in his briefcase are the Glengarry leads. And brass balls. And, <laughs> a, and, a, and a set <laughs> of steak knives. <laughs> oh, the, oh, yeah. I forgot. Those are in there as well. Yeah. Those, well, those are the three and, things. And the, the leads, the balls and and the steak, steak knives. knives that's yeah. it that's all that's in there number three is your fight number, number three, three prize yeah is yeah your yeah the third prize um all right let, let we've also so we've kind of set up what we think this this movie means in the context of 
just, you know, the movie itself, just what it's trying to talk about. Obviously, there's not a context in the scene. It's the opening scene, but they are setting up the motive, the exposition for the movie. You know, we quickly see this desperation and pressure of being a salesman. Um, and, you know, your life and your income is like based on these leads and you're working on commission, right? Um, and the stakes become high pretty quickly at, uh, what is it? Is it, uh, I have a, a real Rancho Estates. Fuck. <laughs> Again, it's like every, it's like they do such an amazing job just in the set dressing and the characters they pick and the clothing they wear and the way the desks look and the way the wallpaper looks to make it feel, I mean, is it just me or is this office next door to the hotel that Barton Fink stays at? <laughs> like, it's like this Kafka-esque fucking nightmare of anonymity and just like grinding desperation where you don't even have a sense of identity to yourself anymore, totally. right? No, I totally, that that is such an amazing <laughs> uh, representation of, of, of the world that we're in, right? Yeah. And you know, at the at first when I, the, I watched this a few times as I always do when we review these scenes, I, you know, I try and watch them a couple times and the, the first time I'm like, okay, yeah, I think we know, like, what makes this a special or unique scene? Why are we reviewing it, right? right. And I obviously went straight to the acting and because of the writing yeah, of, of that, course. right? Obviously. But, like, I was like, yeah, you know, it doesn't do anything filmic um, that is groundbreaking really here that we would normally talk about maybe in another scene, like Children of Men or whatever, like with, with cinematography right. or whatever. It's really big, yeah. But after I watched it a few times from a film standpoint, yeah, there's some timely editing, some great framing here. And then, you know, this scene in particular, and honestly, most of the movie, is at night raining. Yes. And they really show that effect around around everything to the point where I actually read that in the budget, the lighting for the rain was one of the most expensive things for this movie <laughs> to get made. I would think it would be Pacino's salary or I something. I would think because, so, too. Because we were in... We're, this was made in '92, so yeah. we're we're in we're in a lot of these guys' heyday. Yeah. Ed Harris has hair, like, <laughs> uh, like uh, he has like, as much hair as he had in Creep this Show. This is probably one of the move, one of Kevin Spacey's first movies, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, Jack Lemmon and Alan Arkin have been acting for years, yeah. and they're they're kind of the heavyweights. But are they? It's so hard. This is this has got to be some of these guys' favorite movie to do, right? Just because, or, like, I was reading that. Uh, these uh, even when it wasn't their scene, people are showing up to set just to watch the other guys. Really? Yeah, that like, is so cool. Like that's to what know. you that's what you hope and think about. But I guess my original point with um, what it looks like in the film, it, it, it kind of surprised me a little bit because I kind of forgot that. And it's easy to not do anything when th something is based in a play or all set in one space or right. a few spaces over the whole course of it. So it's easy to get lazy with that. But like. I don't know. I mean, look at something like Dogville, like what he did with that. Exactly. You know, like well, and I think I thought a lot about the sense of space in this scene and it being our opener. And I thought a lot about the rain, actually, yeah. also, because, yes, based on a play means that you're going to probably stay pretty tried and true. Although I will say, interestingly, this scene is not in the original Mammoth play. This scene was made for the movie, I'm pretty <sighs> sure. Well, um, it's a great addition. And and I and mean, I, it's it's one of the most classic. It's scenes. one of the most classic scenes. I, I in bet it. when they redo it now, they do it this part. <laughs> well, and if you think about it, you go, you go. Well, you know, obviously the leaving the courthouse scene in Twelve Angry Men isn't in the original play. Sure, but that really, as we felt, added nothing to the overall filmic production, other than oh, we got to know a snippet of who they were. But it didn't matter that they were outside on the steps of the courthouse, right? And so here you're like, they could have had the scene anywhere, but instead they still chose an interior. And I feel like the other movie that this, that, that this reminded me of in terms of that is like the first two thirds of the movie seven. The whole first two Just thirds of the movie the seven day. is all, almost all interiors. Yep. And it's, it's always, always raining. Almost always raining. There's a few times where it's not, but, but it, mostly. And what it does is it gives this pressure. And and again, in yeah. that same way, the dystopic nature of Fincher's the city. really good at it. Yeah, the city they're in, in in Seven is so anonymous and dystopic that when Gwyneth Paltrow's character cries and says, I feel like I don't know anyone in this city, 
you feel it with her because you're like, none of us even have names. Yeah. And even her main characters here in, in Glengarry Glen, Glen Ross, like their last names, it's like they're at war, right? And everywhere they're sure, at, they're, like, they're in like, like Reservoir Dogs or something. Yeah, where yeah. It's Mr. Blonde, you know, Mr. We have Brown. a job to do. And yeah. we're in these like exactly. poorly lit diners or we're like <laughs> sitting at the bar or, an or, or we're at the office, right? And that's it. And it's constantly raining and it just feels dehumanizing. I think the it's, whole purpose of the set dressing is to dehumanize their their job. 100%. And you have control of that as a filmmaker. And even though the audience may not pay attention to it, especially at first, um, it creates this pressure around you yeah. that uh, you, th is unnoticeable that can, you know, you have to do certain things in a movie to make you feel uneasy, right? Yeah. Whether it's a music cue or whatever it is, but something like that with the set dressing or it's dark all the time. I would love to see Fincher direct a mammoth. Oh my a God. Thing. Yeah, let's, like, get let's, of, let's get a redo. Let's get the Davids together. Yeah, let's do a redo <laughs> of Hurley Burley. Let's do that. Oh, um, yeah. One thing I wanted to say is I, I, uh, I love this beautiful moment because we do, we have all the mammoth dialogue. We got our setup of our first group of actors. Yep. Really, again, with the exception of uh, uh, Spacey, um, we know all of these actors at that period of time. They're all heavy hitters, right? I think and so, yeah, like, that, when by the time I saw it, it was, I, I knew Spacey. I think I had to go back and was like, oh my God, because he's kind of doesn't have a very huge it's not job. a huge role yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's kind of playing a weasel which he's actually really good at but um so we have this crackling dialogue we have all this stuff alec baldwin comes in fuck you that's my name like he is batting for the fences and then the the most brilliant thing that could happen happens in the middle of this once more into the breach style speech even though it's about salesmanship it's a pep talk i guess <laughs> So even in the midst of that, he flips the chalkboard over and goes to the acronyms, which is the cheesiest fucking thing you could do, right? So it's like well, even it's though he's for like him to point to that is like you know work culture. This is our these are our guidelines, whatever. It totally, is, right? but at the same time, it's like so eye rollingly corporate silly. Oh yeah, that I'm like oh chef's kiss, man. Like you could not land that any better than after just rubbing their noses in the floor to then be like, A, B, C, always be closing. And you're oh, like, man. is I, this a Best Buy seminar? Like, this I've is amazing. It, yeah, no, I, I've like, worked in marketing for years and years, incredible. and the amount of acronyms yeah. is wild. But it's just funny that they do it, because if you think about some of these other movies that we rolled out these ideas of business culture with, whether you're talking about Wall Street, Wolf of Wall Street, mm -hmm. any of those other movies, uh, you know, Boiler Room that we've talked about, they all have wanted to seem so badass in those big speech moments yep. that they never resort to the corniness. Like, mm. like Mamet is so confident in what he's doing that he's like, and then speak to them like they're literally children, <laughs> like literally have them do the ABCs. Like yeah. it's a great switch up to the corniness aspect, which I just thought was like, it's so perfect. Hey, yeah, it's so day perfect. Of yeah, ABC. ABC. Let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's go it. over it again, you Come guys. Come on, children. Yeah, get your shit together. I just think that that's um, what makes it so special, for sure. And you know, I'm glad we've been recording this long, and we haven't resorted to talking about the undeniable amount of one-liners in this scene. Just yeah, this scene. Just this scene. I forgot how much, how many quotable parts there are. Just this scene alone. You know, coffee's not for closers. Yeah. You think I'm fucking with you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, he's from downtown Mitch and Murray. What's your name? Fuck you, that's, that's my name. Yeah, of course. Uh, takes brass balls to sell real estate. Like, <laughs> um, so many things. Like, just like, I've just watched it so many times in my lifetime, just yeah. watching it again and thinking of the little ways that little things like that get picked up and dragged along mm -hmm. for years that people don't even know it's Glengarry Glen Ross that yeah. that came from. Yeah. Just what a fucking epic amazing scene um, oh, yeah. and it, Baldwin probably the best thing he's ever done right it really is it I mean it has to be it's so swaggering though his 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 character in the departed is basically this guy except he's a cop yeah and that's he's older yeah 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 <laughs> maybe a little saltier 
<laughs> yeah, that's you know that's really good. I like that. Oh well, and then after that, he maybe becomes, not the guy uh, who's gonna take up his watch and be like, "Hey, that well, watch is worth more than your Hyundai." Well, then he becomes Jack <laughs> Jack Donahue from uh, Thirty Rock, isn't that yes. the character's name? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's he's just good at being that prick, <laughs> yeah. right? He's, but when he's he was a good this prick. age, I mean, this is what Hunt for Red October ish kind of. Sure. It's that era. That's he was in that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just thinking like Tom Clancy or whatever, like these kinds yeah, of movies. No, but like, he was, yeah, that was like in a, I'm thinking like Malice. When he was married to Nicole Kidman, wasn't he married or they dated, right? Dated. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, so that that era, I think you saw him do a lot of things, but you didn't see him have this much fun yeah. with this kind of a character. Except for Jack and 30 Rock. He's right. got to be having a fucking blast Oh, with that. my God, yeah. Uh, but everything else, I agree. Yeah, yeah. no, but like uh, this is, uh, you know, he's done a ton of amazing stuff. Definitely the best Baldwin <laughs> It's so good. A mile. It's so good. It's um, like, oh yeah. But, but but he's like he's held his you know obviously he went through t- some tragedy recently that I yeah. can't imagine like how would that that would feel no, and how, like it's exposed it's in the media horrible just everything involved with it is just bad 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 but uh but you know I don't I, he's a generational actor I think at least from our generation oh uh, completely uh, just a guy that you you think of and yeah this is right when he's about to be in his prime right yep. like he, yep. uh, like he was about to be a big ass star yep um so it's a great scene like amazing movie if you somehow have gotten this far and not seen this movie go finish it it is absolutely awesome and it's it's like it's i actually i have a festival idea that i want to do at some point and this movie it definitely fits into this idea which is it should have been boring <laughs> I love it. So you think about movies like uh, Thank You for Smoking or even like The Big Short, and you're like, it's lots of people sitting around talking about shit. The yeah. Insider, right? But then when you watch it, you're like, my God, this is amazing, right? And Glenn my Gary, Glenn Ross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it's one of these movies where you're like, if you start watching it, you're going to have a hell of a hard time not stopping it if you were just going to watch that one scene and just so. watching all of these actors bounce off each other and, these, yeah. and 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 looking at like american capitalism in this way too is uh. really really interesting so um just need gill needs to get an old yeah. break oh just I, one I, good uh, one good break it for really gill. There, there's so much stuff that's taken <laughs> from this that people are unaware of and i, I think it needs to be appreciated Agreed. so happy we did this scene please like and subscribe next week what are we doing what fest are we oh starting? oh my god what are what fest we are, are we pu- start- we are we are pulling the tab on our nicholas cage festival mm. bravo <laughs> now we have already done wicker man so you can go watch that oh if you want yeah to. That, that that's a punishment review that'll though. go in the pantheon of everything else but as is the case in every uh uh cage movie he brings us all in yes, Wicker Man like he does in all the ones we'll be doing. Uh, we're starting off with what, my friend? The one and only face off. Oh, you're going to do what? I'm going to take <laughs> his face. face. Oh. Yeah. Oh, man. Cannot wait. So all that's right. next week. So um, please like and subscribe. Yes. Follow along. Play along. We love you, too. Um, and we'll see you next week. Bye, you guys. <laughs>